you know, in many interviews, people ask me, what's the hardest story that you worked on or what's the hardest story that you came across? And they trust me, the hardest stories are the ones that I didn't film. Or like the hardest things that I saw, the camera didn't see. At 22 years old, Plessy al aqqad found herself last October covering the biggest story in the world, as she and other Palestinian journalists from Gaza endured Israeli bombardment. For weeks, Plessy's coverage documented a raw account of the bombing and destruction in Gaza, but also shined a light on the people there. As a result of this, her presence on social media grew massively. She has since left Gaza and speaks to us from Australia, and she now joins us on Real Talk Online. Plessy al aqqad thank you so much for speaking to us on Real Talk Online. Thank you so much for having me as well. No, it's, it's a real pleasure. You studied journalism at the Eastern Mediterranean University in Cyprus, right? Um, what can you tell me about Plestia before October 7th or before the war on Gaza? That's a very good question. Okay, so I'm only at 22 years old, mm. you know. I have a lot of experience. So my goal was that I graduated from Cyprus. I even graduated in three years on top of my class. And the first thing that I wanted to do is to go back to my homeland, to Gaza, and explore the media industry there to know what I want to do for the rest of my life. Can you tell me about your relationship with journalism? I mean, did it start with, with your teacher, Rawan al-Surani? Is that, is that, is that yeah. how it all started? Uh, yeah. uh, just did research. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, I was in grade six and she was my Arabic teacher and she inspired me a lot. I was like, wow, she's a teacher and a journalist. I just want to be like her when I grow up. So I ended up studying a new media and journalism. And you know what's the nice thing that I, I saw her on the ground when I was working and covering the genocide. She was covering in Arabic and I was working covering in English and they used to take advice from her. So it was nice to see someone you look up to and now we're basically working together. But can you, can you, can you talk to me about the, 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 I guess the trajectory from how you started off uploading short clips to basically going out in the streets and, 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 and filming and documenting? It all happened so fast. Like it all happened, like the situation kept escalating quickly. Like I have a clip where I was at my house the, the 7th of October, the 8th of October, then the 9th of October clips at the hospital, uh, clips at different places. So during the genocide, I only stayed at my house for two days. Then I was wandering in the streets. How did you find the drive to basically report and cover what was happening each day? Because, you, you know, you like you said, you were at the hospital, you, but then it ended up getting a lot more personal because you covered the destruction of your house, your street, your favorite restaurant, your caf you know, favorite cafes. So a lot of these places and a lot of these areas had to do with memories for you, Plestia, on a personal level. So how did you and others find the drive to, to, to keep going, basically? You don't have the option to stop, you mm. know, you feel a sense of responsibility. But to answer your question specifically, what kept me going is the people. Like seeing how people, like many people, they, they came up to me and they're like, let's film together or film my story or share this on your platform. And that made me happy that people find me a reliable source or like they trust me with their story. They want me to work on their story. They want me to post their story through my eyes, like how I see it. They don't want a news agency to post their stories. No, they want their story on my Instagram Why account. do you think that is? So, because I'll post this story as it is. So there was, so you like, were basically if, building trust. There was a level of trust between you. Yeah, and like every they know for a fact everything they say will be posted. I wouldn't pick and choose what parts I post, what parts I don't post. Obviously, I made the clips shorter, but I don't decide for them what they will talk or how I will cover their stories. So seeing that people trust me with their stories and seeing that people trust me and they want to watch my stories as well, gave me a sense of responsibility to keep going. When did you start noticing your impact, Plestia? Basically, I mean, you have about, what, 4.7 million followers today on your Instagram. So when did you start feeling that your stories were basically being spread online, resonating with people, getting a high level of engagement? Okay, I felt that when I saw that many people are going to protest, to protest and they're holding my picture 
or like they're holding my picture and other journalist pictures or many people are drawing me or many people are watching what's happening through my eyes you know it made me happy not that people are drawing me as plistia or holding my picture as plistia as but as plistia the journalist as a palestinian journalist that means the world is interested in what's happening and they want to know what's happening and i used to always check my dms of course i can't see all my dms i have a lot of messages but whenever i see messages people are like you didn't post today are you alive are you okay we heard in the news the one two three happened did one two three happen so i'm like people trust me you know people want people are asking me people are fact checking through me so that gave me a sense of responsibility as well and made me feel that oh i have to be careful what i post i have to keep educating people with what's happening i heard you talk about how people were basically afraid uh, of of also not everyone but some people were afraid of of engaging with you um, as plestia the journalist not Plessia the person, what? but Plessia the journalist. Is that true? It is true, but but like I can't blame the people. I understand the people, and I I understand. What was the coming. reasoning, Plessia? There is this um, elderly person. She is a grandma. So uh, someone once covered her story, and she was talking in a video about Palestine. And then a couple of days later, she was killed by a sniper, not a bombardment or something. You know, so the other side, they do follow social media and you might get targeted because of a story you penned or something you said on social media. So I never pressure people to do interviews or to film with them or to post them on social media because I don't want anything bad to happen for them. Then they'll feel I'm the reason or something. Everyone is getting killed. Everyone is getting targeted. The children, babies, journalists, everyone. So many people are afraid of the media. They're afraid of journalists. So you can't blame them I do understand where they're coming from you know in many interviews people ask me what's the hardest story that you worked on or what's the hardest story that you came across yeah. and they trust me the hardest stories are the one that I didn't film or like the hardest things that I saw the camera didn't see like what hmm. like there's this lady I talked about her many times but because I'll never forget how she looks like uh, basically, basically, like she lost her her arm and she lost two of her legs. She's twenty nine and she's only living with like a face and that part of her body. So I I met her in the hospital and turns out she was following me and she knows me but she didn't want to do interviews or any pictures taken of her. So we we're talking just off camera, mm -hmm. and I totally understand her. Like I tried putting myself into her position, like. Like, I can't Im imagine living the rest of my life with only a face and one arm and part of my body and filming to the world and showing them that I look like that because of Israel. Like, it's so sad. It's so sad. What were the conversations with your parents like, Plestia? I mean, you were on the road, basically, you and, and, and other Palestinian journalists, you and other team members covering what's happening. Um, but I remember there were videos of you talking about the fact that you weren't staying where your parents were staying. So you were staying in, in other areas out of fear that they would be targeted. So with that in mind, what kind of conversations were you having with your parents? Tough conversations. <laughs> sure. But how would you update them in the, uh, during the internet blackout, for example? Like sometimes I know where they are, so I used to go to go there, but sometimes it's dangerous to keep moving and it's dangerous to go there. So I don't update them. <laughs> they just wow. live. Yeah. So that must have been terrifying for, for both of them. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Everyone is not asking me, especially about my mom. Like how my dad uh, lives in Turkey, by the way, he's working there. So mm -hmm. he wasn't in Gaza during all the events. So everyone is asking me, how did your mom let you do that? Yeah. Every, everyone is wondering, and I do have the same. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I we just, should bring her on and ask her, because I, I feel like that would be the million-dollar question, wouldn't it? Yeah, but my mom knows how much I love journalism. Going back to 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 your coverage and your documentation of what what happened, out of curiosity, do you rewatch the content that you have put out? Do you do you sit down now and rewatch it? Yeah, I do that. Yeah. Because when I was in Gaza, I never had the chance to do that. I was just like, 
posting, posting, posting the whole time, but I never w watched what I'm posting. And how do you feel now when you watch it? I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't understand how all that happened in a short period of time, you know? And I read, uh, I read from my diary entries. So today I was reading what I wrote on the 29th of October. Right. Okay. So basically what I wrote that day, I was writing how uh, on the 9th of October, I thought like I got this place. So I thought that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Then when, uh, when people in the North were told to go to the South, I thought that's the worst thing, thing could happen. Journalists are getting targeted nothing worse will happen oh now the families of journalists are getting targeted as well so whenever i watch the videos or i watch uh, or i read what i wrote i'm like wow how the situation kept escalating quickly that you never ever had the time to process what happened and do you feel like you're processing it now no, I don't feel that I'm in the processing stage now because whenever I process anything or I process something, another thing happens. It's hard to keep up. It's hard to keep understanding what a world we live in. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because you, you had a quote, and let me read it to you because it was really, you know, really stood out for me. Um, you said, during the war, I didn't have time to feel emotions. Um, crying or feeling emotions was a privilege. Why do you say that? Because you don't have time to cry. You don't have time to understand what you're feeling or what's happening. A lot, a lot, a lot is happening at the same time. I don't know how to explain it or to put it into words. But for example, we were doing an interview with a lady. She told us about how she lost her whole family. Like it's a three floor building and all the family is gone and only a young girl survived. So we have this lady and the young girl who survived, and now she's looking after her. She's severely, the young girl is severely injured, but she survived. She, so she was telling us what happened and how she lost many and many members of her family. And I was doing the interview and I was like, wow, that's a lot. You know, how will she live? Like, I was trying to process what's happening. Then we got a phone call about a different place where we should go and cover what's happening there. And I saw something worse than the story that I saw. Then I got a message, someone I know is not, got killed. You see, like a lot is always mm. happening in the same time. So you don't have time to process. It's not like I'm an emotional, I'm an emotionless person or mm. I don't cry or I don't have emotions, but you don't have time to understand or to just put your emotions out there. Mm. Can you tell me about when you left Gaza for Australia? Okay, I never ever imagined in my life that I'll even visit Australia. Like it's so far away. My uncle lives here and he visits us. So why would we go there? It was an emergency visa that your uncle basically yeah. applied for. Yeah. Uh, then it's weird how overnight I'm basically here. And I don't know until when. When you say you don't know it's until weird. when, are, <laughs> I don't you, know you're that. saying you're so you're saying that you you still want to go back to Gaza. Of course, I want to go back, but to be realistic, the infrastructure is demolished, mm -hmm. the schools, buildings, the health system is demolished. You know, so I don't know how will the situation be when all this is over. Like, of course, I'd love to go back, but how will the situation be? I think that's what maybe some people don't understand is that you didn't leave for Australia by choice, right? It wasn't and it's choice. not like I'm here on vacation. Mm. What's it like going from one extreme to another, Plistia? You know, from going from Gaza under bombardment to Australia, where it's calm and nothing really is going on. It's so, it's so weird. It's so weird how a minute you're in a place and all you hear is the sounds of drones, bombs, airstrikes 24 seven. You can barely find any food or any water or even a shelter. Then suddenly you're in a different country with a different time zone. And you just see that like a few kilometers away, people are dying. A few kilometers away, people are just shopping and living their lives. Like it traveling, through the it, it, traveling made me feel like what is life what is death anymore like 
what is this world we live in you know it felt so weird i don't know how to put my emotions into words to be honest yeah and you've you've said something like uh, i remember you said something like even taking a shower in australia taking a shower at any time that you want is has been has yeah. been weird for you why why did you say that because whenever i was able to take a shower uh, back in gaza during the genocide it felt like eid like a holiday i used to tell my friends that i took a shower so when mm. i traveled i was like wow there's water 24 7. you can take shower whenever i remember the first time uh, the first time that i took a shower i used to take a picture then i'm like why are you taking a picture you can it's yeah. not an it's not an event you're able yeah yeah, it's not an event, exactly. So you just like you can't go on with your daily life without pausing and feeling privileged. Like I'm here, like wow, there's many food, there's surplus of water. Like I can drink water whenever I can eat as much as I can. As you said, it's hard to go from an extreme to an extreme. Hmm. And what what has been your experience like with Western media? You said you've done over twenty interviews what do you feel like the media still isn't getting right about Gaza? Or do you feel that way? Everything. <laughs> Everything. I, I feel the Western media just focuses on two to three points. They don't focus on the full pictures. They don't talk to us as humans. Like, okay, I'm a journalist, but I'm a human before being a journalist. You what know? do you mean by that? I, Okay, I'll tell you what I mean by that, you know, because many and many Palestinians are getting killed. People, st it feels that people started thinking this is our role, like we're born to die, we're born to get killed. They don't understand that we're not numbers, that we're humans, we have dreams, we had a life. Okay, Gaza is uh, like Palestine is occupied, we're living under occupation, life in Gaza is full of challenges and full of struggles, but we still love our life there. We still manage to have restaurants, nice cafes. We still manage to have life despite the occupation and all the struggles and challenges. So I feel people don't understand that. Like whenever I post something about my life before the 7th of October, some people are like, how are you living under occupation? You have this nice restaurant, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and I blame the media. I blame the media for that. The, the media only shows destruction of Gaza. It only shows... Palestinians getting killed that people think that's a role they don't show the full picture they don't humanize us as people mm -hmm. so that's the thing that's why I believe in social media and how much social media is doing change because it's a platform it's giving a platform and a voice for the Palestinians okay we're getting shadow banned a lot and many people's accounts are even getting deleted but that's the thing you're a journalist a reporter in real life you get killed you want to post about what's happening, you get shadow bound. So it's like the world is against us, but what can we do that won't stop us? And on that note, thank you for staying up, first of all, Plestia, and thank you for, for, for joining us. It was a real pleasure speaking to you. I appreciate you taking time for me. It was nice talking to you as well. Thank, thank you. you. Plestia. Thank you so much.